Hi everyone, I'm Erin Connolly. Thanks so much for joining us live here on Facebook, where all week long we have been answering your coronavirus vaccine questions by talking directly with doctors from all across the state. Remember, you can still submit your questions using the Channel 3 app or by commenting on this post below, which I will be looking at throughout the duration of this 30 minutes. You can also call us at 860-244-1790. And joining me tonight is Dr. Jessica Abrantes Figueroa from St. Francis Hospital. Thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I want to tell people a little <laughs> bit about you. You're a member of the Governor's Vaccine Advisory Board, uh, and you also work for Trinity Health overall. Correct. Okay, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. So <laughs> let's start with this. The CDC this week was saying that one in three people are not sure if they're going to take the vaccine or said they definitely won't take the vaccine. It is clear from that that we have some work to do. And I think that is also why we've been holding this vaccine week, because so many people have so many questions. Uh, and there are probably people who are watching this right now online who are in that group saying, I don't know if I want to get the vaccine or I'm definitely not getting it. What do we need to do and what do you need to provide to them? How do we shift this one in three number? Great, um, you know, comments, questions, and, and I think it's important for people to realize that, you know, it's okay to have questions and, you know, think whether or not they should get the vaccine. And as a physician, especially as an infectious disease physician, um, our job certainly isn't to force people, but it's so that people have the right information. And I think there's so much misinformation out there that makes it quite difficult for people to hesitate in getting a vaccine that's been shown to be safe in the studies we have and effective at preventing, you know, symptomatic infection as well as hospitalizations and deaths. So really forums like this, forums that, you know, the Connecticut Advisory Committee is also doing too, just continuing to, to give out education and being very transparent too with all the information that's out there. Today, appointments are now available for those age 65 and up, uh, which is welcome news to many. But there is still a big issue with demand. The governor talking about it today that just in our state alone, we only get about 69,000 vaccines every week. He's hoping that that will ramp up. But right now, the supply is just not meeting the demand. Although Dr. Fauci did say today he's hoping that the vaccine will be available for everyone by April. Is the demand? still a big is the supply I should say still a big issue that you're seeing I think it's it's an issue in the sense that you know we're only allocated what we can get to Connecticut um, but all hosp hospital systems including Trinity Health of New England we are doing our absolute best to really using all of the allocation that we receive so from our standpoint we have the vaccine we're giving it out we're not wasting any doses um, at this point, it's really up to the administration, and hopefully we can continue to get more vaccines so that we can continue with that whole supply-demand issue and getting everybody vaccinated. The other thing that I saw that was interesting today, and then we can start to get to some of the questions that have been popping up here on Facebook, is that when someone is fully vaccinated, meaning that if they are part of the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine, they've gotten their two doses, uh, they no longer will have to quarantine, according to the CDC, if they come into contact with someone who is infected. That really changes the game. Yeah, so, and obviously this is all new information that the CDC has, has made public and came out with a statement. What I want people to understand is that the vaccine is 95% effective. Um, so nothing is really 100% effective. So folks can still get infected. The, the fact is, is that we're not changing anything else other than they're mentioning the quarantine. So even fully vaccinated persons would still have to continue to mask around others. Um, although yes, if fully vaccinated over two weeks and within the three month period too, because we're just not yet sure what happens after three months, because we still need that data. We still need to wait to see um, all the patients that have been or the folks that have been in those trials um, before we were to loosen that up even further. But again, the importance is that these are folks that still need to mask um, and still need to do the right thing even in the community. 
And why should they do that? For people who are watching right now, they're saying, well, if I still have to socially distance and I still have to wear a mask, what's the point of getting the vaccine? What do you say to them? So the, the big thing is that these trials have done an ama amazing job in showing that it can reduce symptomatic infection, hospitalization, and death. One thing that it didn't look at as well was asymptomatic infection. So if I am fully vaccinated, I could still get infected, have no symptoms, but I could potentially still transmit it to others, especially those who are unvaccinated or our more vulnerable population as well. So that's the big key point until we have more data and, and data is coming out that's showing that potentially even just being vaccinated, even with asymptomatic transmission, it's likely gonna be a, be a benefit. But until we have more, until we can really vaccinate more folks too with herd immunity, I think it's important for us to not let our guards down. There are a lot of people writing right now with uh, specific conditions that they have, including Christine is saying, I have an aorta aneurysm. Is it safe for me to get the vaccine? What do you say to that? So I would say definitely. Um, most conditions, uh, if not all conditions, there's really no contraindication in getting the, the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, conditions with regards to cardiovascular disease, um, you know, a lot of other conditions, diabetes, et cetera, we know what it can do in those patients when they get infected and they can end up with severe disease, hospitalization. So yes, the benefits of the vaccines would definitely outweigh any risks. Pat is asking about the side effects and uh, from what we've been hearing usually or typically the first dose is not giving people as many side effects as the second dose. Why is that and what are the side effects that people should expect? So it's common with vaccine series when we have kind of a, a second dose or a booster effect that the first shot is usually it's just priming your immune system. It's waking up your immune system to recognize that. When we get the second dose, it's then showing again that, hey, there's this ant or antigen, I should say, and it needs to wake up your immune system again. So we see that immune system react a little bit more strongly, I guess you can say. And it's not everybody, but yes, it's typical. And the study showed that as well, that the second dose may cause more um, prominent symptoms, I should say. So things like fevers can be common or can be seen, chills, body aches. Um, and again, it's your immune system just reacting to the vaccine and a very normal process that happens with a lot of other vaccines. So basically it's saying this is working and it's working to protect you. Um, I also wanna ask you what Cindy wanted to know, what if you have fish allergies, is the shot okay? So right now, the only contraindication is any specific allergy to a specific component of either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine. That being said, folks who have anaphylaxis or a history of anaphylaxis may just need to have a little bit more caution. Um, so we do recommend if people have an EpiPen for any reason to certainly carry it with them. Um, and that's also why people are, if they have a history of anaphylaxis, um, so not just normal or I guess you say light allergies, but anaphylaxis, we would watch them or monitor them for a full 30 minutes after the va their vaccine. Um, but otherwise, even the anaphylaxis that have happened have been extremely rare, despite the millions of folks that we have now been able to vaccinate across America. Holly is saying, I am a type one diabetic and have celiac. Can I get the shot? I was told not to because of the autoimmune disease. And there are obviously plenty of people with autoimmune diseases all across the state. Uh, what's the best advice for them? So there's a lot of talk and again, misinformation about, you know, what can happen with the vaccine in certain conditions. Um, but especially even something like diabetes, it's important for people to realize that the risk with getting infected with COVID is much higher than any potential theoretical risk of the vaccine. And to date, there's been no issues with folks who have autoimmune disorders getting the vaccine. Sarah is asking a bunch of questions about children and the vaccine, whether it's safe for children. Uh, she also says this is gene therapy that changes your DNA and cannot be undone. Uh, they have no long-term studies do your own research before you decide. I'm sure Sarah is like many who who have questions about kids and also questions about 
the vaccine in general? Sure. So to tackle I'll tackle the gene therapy um, uh, comment first. So this in no way alters our DNA. So the vaccine is just messenger RNA. So it's instructions on how to make a component of that SARS-CoV-2 protein. It enters our cell. It never enters our cell nucleus. And our cell nucleus is exactly where our DNA, our genetic makeup is. So it doesn't interact at all with our DNA. So that is false. And again, another reason where there's a lot of misinformation out there as well. With regards to the children, um, so children are usually just like pregnant women, breastfeeding women, sometimes they're excluded from a lot of these trials. We start with adults and then we go on to children. So right now Moderna and Pfizer are actually studying this in children um, and they usually use much smaller numbers, but to see if there's any other differences seen with the vaccines as well. So at some point we will likely continue to see that data and likely it will also be uh, emergency use authorization approved. And right now, even Pfizer actually had their authorization for 16 and above. So 16 and 17 year olds who are still minors can actually still get the vaccine. For those uh, under that age, I have two children, five and two. Uh, how do we protect kids against the virus? Is it just plain old wearing a mask and social distancing? I think, and I have kids too, so that's a big important thing. We wanna know how do we protect our kids if our kids can't get the vaccine yet too. So the masks, the social distancing, um, the one wonderful thing, I guess you can say, or nice thing that has, we've seen with COVID is that you know children are much less affected. Um, that being said, they can still get sick and they can get very sick too, and there've been few, but there have been deaths as well, even among children. Um, what we've seen with the masking, it works even across schools in Connecticut too. There haven't been significant outbreaks just like around the country as well where masks are working. Kids are still able to go to school with the distancing, the masking, et cetera. We touched on this uh, a little bit on Tuesday night, but in terms of uh, there has been a lot of misinformation out there about fertility. And I've spoken to a number of young women uh, who are very concerned about getting this uh, vaccine, especially those in their 20s who still want to have children. Uh, has there been any data or information that shows this could cause infertility in young women? Uh, and then after you're able to answer that, if you can also talk about whether the vaccine is OK for those looking to get pregnant, those who are currently pregnant, as well as those breastfeeding right now. So there's no data to support that it would cause any type of infertility um, at all. And again, these uh, studies get done in animal studies prior to even you know hitting human studies as well. And again, a lot of the misinformation that we see and no data to suggest that there's any infertility, um, even with regards to infertility, but also long-term effects too. Um, there's really no vaccine that causes infertility issues either. Um, and, and again, with regards to even long-term effects, just to mention that too, the reason um, you know we do the studies that we do and the safety trials as well is because you know at least six to eight weeks is when if we're going to see um, significant side effects, that's when we'll catch it, and that's why it takes that long even after a trial is complete before even FDA gets approval or emergency use authorization approval as well. Um, and then obviously we bring it out to millions of people afterwards to see if there's any other type of, you know, adverse reaction that typically can't be seen until we vaccinate millions or, you know, do the mass vaccination that we're doing right now across the country. Um, with regards to pregnancy, breastfeeding as well, again, both American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology as well as the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine um, have put out statements that pregnant women um, can have severe disease with COVID-19 and there's no, you know, the, any of the risks are theoretical um, and that they advocate that women should get the vaccine if they are kind of in line or ready to, to be in that um, category that, that needs to be vaccinated. You know, healthcare workers, that happened a lot. Um, we've had a lot of healthcare workers who needed the vaccine and who have gotten the vaccine, there's always that hesitation because it's not just the person, but it's mom and baby. Um, so it, it's important for people to talk to their OBGYN um, with breastfeeding. 
it's also been encouraged that if women, um, to, for women to have that choice to get the vaccine as well. And there's been no um, you know, signal to suggest that there would be any detriment to mom or baby uh, getting vaccinated as well. Okay, good to know. I think that's definitely a big concern of people. So I hope that has quelled the fears of many. Uh, sticking with the female theme here today, uh, some new news about the vaccine and mammograms. Uh, that it could actually cause some type of false positive based on your body adjusting to the vaccine. Can you talk about that a little bit and whether women should wait to get a mammogram a certain number of months or days or weeks after receiving the vaccine? Great question. So both vaccines can actually cause um, our lymph nodes. So we have lymph nodes under our arms, um, sometimes lymph nodes in our neck as well to enlarge. And that's just your immune self, immune system, excuse me, ramping up. Um, so it could be a normal side effect of the vaccine. That being said, you know, with no vaccines, it can be abnormal to have enlarged lymph nodes. So the recommendation right now is to wait about one month at least before getting um, screening mammograms, I should say. Now, diagnostic would be a little bit different. So if someone has already some abnormality, some concern for cancer, we don't suggest that people wait. Um, but if it's a routine screening um, test for, you know, obviously cancer with regards to mammograms, we would suggest people waiting about at least a month period or at least um, definitely giving that information too before getting your mammogram that you've had the COVID-19 vaccine. Okay, good to know. That's important. Um, Valerie on Facebook has a question. Can a husband and wife sign up together and get an appointment at the same time and the same place? She would not want to be alone if a reaction happens. So potentially, um, as long as both uh, folks are qualified or kind of meet into the category of being eligible for the vaccine, um, for Trinity Health of New England, folks can start to sign up at trinityhealthofne.org slash appointment. Um, and then, you know, we have lots of appointments available, whether it's at St. Francis or one of our other sites. Um, so you could potentially try to match. You still, again, if you go through certain measures, um, each person needs a separate appointment. Um, but potentially you could do that so that you can go together and have a buddy. Very nice. Got to stick together during these times, that's for sure. Um, a lot of people have been asking, obviously, about the allergy component. We touched on it a little bit, how you typically stay for 15 minutes just to make sure that you don't have any uh, bad side effects right away or an allergic reaction. So Barbara on Facebook was asking, are there EpiPens at these locations just in case someone does have a severe bout of anaphylaxis? Absolutely. So any of our clinics and clinics across Connecticut are fully equipped to deal with the potential for anaphylaxis. Okay, good to know. Maria saying, I have type 2, she's a type 2 diabetic. How soon can she get her vaccine? We're talking a lot about uh, people have been patient, uh, especially people with those really underlying health conditions and there are so many out there all across the state uh, right now we're vaccinating 65 to 74 but the governor has been clear that that number is over 300,000 people so that could take four weeks or so um, so for people with underlying conditions say type 2 diabetes type 1 diabetes um, when do you expect them to be able to get the vaccine so like you mentioned, um, a key word here is patience, and, and I appreciate everyone having as much patience as possible and, you know, the outpouring where people do want to get vaccinated. So right now, unfortunately, it's 65 and older. Um, subsequently, so likely, probably early March um, to mid-March is when it's expected that it would then open up to um, less than 65 and those with what we call comorbidities or different conditions such as diabetes potentially um, and then essential workers as well. The full list of kind of uh, diseases that will be that comorbidity is still kind of pending. The Connecticut Advisory Committee is certainly going to look at everything that is with the CDC, um, but it will likely encompass many, many diseases. Um, and this is just a good point that, you know, those folks who have to wait and be patient right now, um, it should be more of a, we are in this together for the people who can get the vaccine right now to go and get it so that their next colleagues or their next friends, families 
um, can be able to get it when they can. And I think it's nice, too, that not that there's an end in sight, so to speak, but that there's something that we have that can help for so long. I mean, we've been dealing with this for almost a year now, and I think we many people were hoping that something would come out. And now, finally, uh, you know, my parents just got their first shot last week, and it just was such a relief to me. They haven't been able to see the grandkids. They haven't been able to see us, and there are so many families all across the state, all across the country right now in similar positions, whether their family member is potentially in a nursing home. Uh, just so many families have not been able to do what we should be able to do for so, so long. So I think this is, um, you know, providing a lot of hope. So we do have to pack our patience, as they say, because it's, it's a tough situation. Um, a lot Absolutely. of people are saying their research is still going on. and. Uh, this vaccine uh, came to fruition in what some people feel is a quick nature. Um, if you can kind of address people's concerns about how quickly we were able to come up with these vaccines, because sometimes they, they do take years. Uh, this was obviously a shorter amount of time, but then you take into account flu vaccines, which we do every year, which is obviously a short amount of time. Uh, how do you make people feel better about something that concerns them, given that we don't have all the data that we would like and uh, the speed at which this came to fruition can be concerning to some? Sure, um, absolutely. And you mentioned even flu shot. Yes, we're able to redo a flu shot once a year uh, or each year as well. The other thing, too, is that we always talk about how the messenger RNA is a novel idea or a novel concept and hasn't been done before. But this has actually been studied for decades. Um, so even prior outbreaks, Ebola, et cetera, um, again, those kind of outbreaks kind of petered out. Obviously, we're not seeing that with COVID-19, so we've had to continue and really ramp up to, to get a vaccine. So the studies and the, the research behind this has been going on for decades. The other thing that has been done with these trials and these vaccines is that we've done multiple facets at the same time or things have been doing have been done simultaneously. Um, so we don't really wait for one phase to go on to the other. Manufacturing was already starting to be ramped up the, um, while other phases were going on too. Uh, the other thing that I want people to understand is these were not small trials. These were tens of thousands of people that it was done on. Um, so there was no skimping with regards to that. And the same thing with, there was no skimping with regards to safety as well. And that right timing of when people got vaccinated and how long afterwards was it emergency use authorization approved. And the numbers we used in these studies compare, if not are actually somewhat larger than some of the other vaccines that have been out even well before COVID. Marcy on Facebook is posing a really interesting question. We have talked a lot about the side effects of the vaccine, especially after that second dose. She's saying she has already had both doses of the Pfizer vaccine. She has had no side effects whatsoever from either dose. Is this normal? And does that mean the vaccine is still working? So it can be normal. So each person is different. Our immune systems are different. Um, also, depending on if other people have certain, you know, diseases, whether people are very healthy, etc. Um, so it can be very normal for people to have very different um, side effects to the vaccine. Yet can have the same amount of immunity. Even the immunity, I mean, again, things can wax and wane. It can vary slightly differently from each person, um, but nothing to worry about. And I'm glad that she got vaccinated. All right, Marcy, you hear that? <laughs> You're good to go. We're all unique. Uh, let's talk about herd immunity too. That's a phrase that we have heard a lot about and everyone's hoping for herd immunity. Uh, what exactly does that mean for people who are not familiar with that and how many people do you think need to get vaccinated for us to reach herd immunity? So herd immunity is, is the concept where uh, if whether it's through infection, which would be catastrophic, um, or vaccine, we can get people where they can be potentially immune to the infection. When I say it could be catastrophic if we just let people be infected, um, that would be extraordinarily irresponsible for the United States, for the world. That would mean we're allowing people to just continue to get infections. 
continue to need the hospitalizations, deaths, et cetera. But with a vaccine, we can now prevent symptomatic infection, those hospitalizations and those deaths too. So the number estimated is at least 80% plus um, across the United States. And, you know, hopefully at one point we can make this across the world too, so that we can really prevent the transmission and, you know, see those curves, not only flatten, but just crash down to below flattening so that we can really fight this pandemic. Wouldn't that be nice? And today, some good news, a big headline from the gut that our uh, positivity rate was down to 2.32%, which is the lowest we've seen in three months. So that was a small piece of good news, but obviously we are not out of the woods just yet, especially we're talking those variants and the mutations of COVID-19 are obviously posing a new threat. Is that something that we should be concerned with? And do we know whether the vaccines that have been approved will work on those variants? So it's, it's definitely something that we should be concerned about, but understand that we have the tools to fight this. Um, so what I typically tell my patients or colleagues is, uh, you know, we don't need to see variants if we stop the replication. So if we stop the spread, we would have to worry less about variants. Unfortunately, some of these variants are more transmissible, meaning they can easily pass more from one person to another. The studies continue to be ongoing, but most of the vaccines should be effective um, against these variants. And obviously there's depends on the vaccine, et cetera, and some of the vaccines that are, are not yet emergency use authorization approved too. Um, but something that's really key and really important is that even if there's a decrease in efficacy due to some of these variants with these vaccines, it's still reason enough to continue to vaccinate across America, across Connecticut, um, so that we can really you know, hunker down and get that herd immunity. Talking about the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, uh, it's a little bit different than the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines in that it is just one dose instead of two doses. Uh, and additionally, the efficacy rate is not as good as Moderna and Pfizer. For people who are concerned, once the Johnson and Johnson's out, they go, they make their appointment to get their shot. Do you have an option to choose which vaccine that you want? Because I assume some people may like the idea of the one dose, but others may say, you know what, I'd rather get the two doses because the percentage is higher. So right now, Johnson & Johnson is not yet emergency use authorization approved, but we're certainly expecting that it will be um, shortly after the, the meeting that happens with the FDA. So right now with Moderna and Pfizer, because of allocation and supply, um, patients aren't given or folks who come in to get vaccinated aren't really given the choice. Um, that may change with Johnson & Johnson, but again, when we're doing mass vaccination like we're doing, it's really just important for people to be able to, to get the vaccine that is given to them or that's at hand. Um, especially if we get a third vaccine, it'll be great to have more, I guess you can say inventory. Um, but even that with allocation and knowing which one will be on hand will be difficult to kind of, you know, gauge as well with our patients. There has been a disturbing gap in vaccinations in terms of minorities. Uh, we've been covering this for a few days now, and it's alarming to say the very, very least. Um, why do you think that? so many minorities in Connecticut are being left behind. There's a much higher percentage of whites who have gotten the vaccine as opposed to uh, African-Americans as well as Hispanic or the Latino community. What do we do to reverse that trend? Right, so I, I think a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, access, uh, which Trinity Health is trying its best to make sure that these folks have that access, you know, and not just even hesitancy too, but, you know, uh, a lot of us are privileged that we can easily drive to a certain center and, you know, we may have to bring centers. We may have to think about mobile centers too with vaccinating as well. I think education is key too. So uh, because some of the, the minorities, et cetera, have, you know, they have reason to, to, to be somewhat against the community based on the history that's, that's happened in the United States. So just really having that education and that community, that outreach, 
really listening to why they may not want to get vaccinated and what their whys are as well so that we can really reach out um, and again, doing forums like this, um, you know, collaborating with a lot of the community health centers too, to make sure that they have access to the vaccines. Well, I really can't thank you enough for being with us tonight. You're an absolute wealth of knowledge. Uh, your insight and your expertise is just invaluable. And we are so appreciative of you being with us. Dr. Jessica Abrantes Figueredo from St. Francis Hospital. Thank you. And thank you so much to also your whole team at Trinity Health and at St. Francis Hospital. There are so many people who have been putting in long hours and uh, some difficult days since this all started. So thank you from the bottom of my heart and from all of us here at Channel 3. Your work, hard work, does not go unnoticed and it is so appreciated. Thank you so much.